I, I think I take, I, I'd like to take a little bit of a positive uh, position here. And that is, I believe that, um, you know, the, we have three great world powers, of course, of course, right now that have risen in Russia, China, and the United States. And one of them is uh, confronting, shall we say, the other two world powers. So I think now that the governments and leaders of both Russia and China have come to the conclusion, this is pure my speculate, purely my, my own speculation, but I think they've come to the conclusion that the world is transitioning, particularly economically transitioning. And since the U.S. empire has used its economic power in recent years as its uh, principal tool of coercion, I think they realize that this is going to be very upsetting, concerning, et cetera, to the people who run this empire. I believe from a positive note that they have taken the responsibility of transitioning the world into this new order um, without, I hate to use this word, but I'll use it, provoking the crazies in DC into pushing the nuclear button. So while we've got um, a, a Washington DC neocon group that's clearly unhinged, I think the saving grace is that the Russians and the Chinese understand that they're dealing with unhinged people and they under and they see it as their responsibility to transition us in there to manage this transition without totally freaking out these neocons to the point where they push the button. I know they have to protect themselves. So I, I'll, I'll take a positive perspective on that. And I believe that the Russian and the Chinese leaders have the capability working together to do that. Hmm. I think people underestimate the extent to which they do work together, even now, actually. I mean, there was these meetings between Putin and Xi Jinping at Samarkand. And we know of two meetings that they had in Samarkand. One was a one-to-one -one meeting, which is the public one. Then there was another meeting which they had with the president of Mongolia. Lavrov, by the way, has confirmed to us that they had more meetings, <laughs> which were sort of more informal meetings. But they were clearly talking a lot with each other. Then we also know that their national security advisors, Petrushev and Yang, I, I get his name wrong, but anyway, call, let's call him Yang, that they met as well, I think, I believe, in Beijing. And there's rumours, by the way, which obviously we're not in a position to confirm, that, they're now, that they were discussing amongst lots of other topics joint production of advanced microchips. That this is one of the big topics on, on the agenda. Now, that's true, even if it was on, you know, little things like that then that tells you how extensive this cooperation, this cooperation between those two powers has now become. So I, I think you're absolutely right. And one of the things that came across from Samarkand was how very far the two governments went to make it clear that coordination between each other was something that they needed to go on enhancing all the time. So they are a team. Yeah. You know, there's so there's, you know, people they have been. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Definitely. And people have been con comparing these times to, you know, pre-World War One and pre-World War Two and things of that nature. And I think you can find some comparisons that would be accurate. But I think there is a, um, a dynamic that's different now that has to be taken into account. For a country to successfully prosecute a war, as, as we've seen in in in, uh, in Russia, the um, the as Abraham Lincoln said, you know, a leader can never get too far out in front of the public opinion of the people of of their particular country. And what we've seen, mm -hmm. the um, uh, the leadership, I think, very quite skillfully, the leadership of, of Russia. What they've been able to do is something even I think more uh, impressive, and that is. <clears throat> to get what you know we call in the business world market insistence to kind of hesitate to do something mm -hmm. until it gets to the point where the people in their country actually demand it and by the time they move the yeah. people in russia are screaming what's wrong with you why won't you do x and then the russian government would say well you know we really didn't want to do x but we have no choice now because we've been so pressed by our people mm -hmm. that's why you see these numbers of 70 and 80 percent support because they wait until the people scream for it and then 
they're simply giving the people mm -hmm. what they want. And I think that's brilliant po uh, politics. And, and, you know, it's kind of the way I think. So of course I would think it was brilliant. You know, you get ahead of people and you get people to beg you for things again in business, yeah. which I have a little bit of a background in market insistence is the term you want the people out there begging for your product. That's what they do now. Here's the dynamic I think that's so different from World War I and World War II, and that is in order to prosecute a war, you have to have support of the people at home. Look what's happening in the U.S. Look what's happening in Europe. The people there are now, you know, they're at the most basic level of survival, food, shelter, things of that nature. Right. So there the, the, generally a government will try to frighten you into supporting a war based on what security. You have to support this war because the Huns or whoever it is are going to invade. They're going to, you know, kill all the men and enslave the women and children. Right. So let's go to war. And the people say, OK, but the people in the EU, the, particularly in the EU, but also starting to get that way in the U.S., are looking around at their basic survival needs. Um, that would be provided, shepherded by their leaders. And they're saying to their leaders, we already don't have our basic needs to survival at home. And you're trying to frighten us into saying there's somebody out there that's going to get us. Well, we're not going to live long enough to get out there. So I think the dynamic is the um, dysfunction within the U.S. And, you know, I use this term, the U.S. empire and its allies or colonies in um, in Europe. So how are they going to continue? How, the, let me put it, put it uh, uh, more basic. The leaders in the West have the dual problem of dealing with this problem that they've created with Russia while trying to manage massive dysfunction and virtual economic collapse at home, which means that time's not on their side. And I think Russia and China know if they can get this thing into the winter, they don't have to go a long time before people are going to start turning their countries inside out and we're going to start seeing um, regime change all throughout the West. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see that. I mean, I, I noticed that I was getting reports from Greece from my brother in Greece about energy rationing now being introduced into Greece. This directly after huge increases in cost of electricity in Greece. And he was saying, you know, we've been asked to pay far more for getting far less. And apparently the people he was working with, many of them were close to tears about this. This is what he was telling me. So, and one can see this repeating itself right across Europe. But isn't there a danger that as these people in these Western governments, in Washington itself, become increasingly concerned that things are going to start turning against them, that, you know, the war... I actually think we'll come to the war in Ukraine in a moment, but you know, that as things start to go wrong, that they're going to start looking for increasingly dangerous ways to escalate themselves. And that could take us further along the path that people like Vucic was saying. Yes, I, I absolutely agree. And I would say one of those things was the Nancy Pelosi trip. That was a perfect indicator. Well, if, if look right now, we have two bills in Congress. One of the bills would make Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. And Russia has said, if that happens, our diplomatic um, relations will absolutely collapse. Another of the bills would give like three or four billion dollars to Taiwan. Ostensibly, we know that goes to like Raytheon and General Dynamics, but ostensibly three and a half billion dollars to Taiwan for um, weapons. And China has said, if that happens, our diplomatic relations will collapse. So right now we are on the book. We have two bills in Congress that were they to go through, were they to get signed by um, the Biden administration, which I have great. I, I put it like this. I can't see one may be signed. I don't think both of them will be signed. But the bottom line is if they were both signed, uh, diplomatic relations would collapse with both. So, again, I think this gets back to remember, um, it's not what happens to you in life. It's how you respond to what happens to you that determines, you know, your path. Right. So, again, they can do all the provocations in the world. I, I, I think I saw it as a hint when Pelosi went to Taiwan and everyone said, that's it. It's going to be war. And China sat back and said, we're going to make some moves, but we're not going to be baited into this. We know their game. We're not biting the hook. We have more time than they have. They don't have time. So I think, again, the Russian and Chinese leaders, while they will be baited, 
unless there's an all out attack on them or some kind of a, attack on them, I don't think they'll respond uh, militarily. Of course, we can't rule that out. But again, I think the military um, in um, NATO, the military in the U.S. understands the jeopardy that they would be putting themselves in and the pushback from the military would be great. So, again, yes, I have some fear. But again, I think Russia and China understand the provocations and, and we're pro likely discussing um, mutual responses. Let's not forget before the 24th of February, a week or two before then, uh, Xi and um, Putin met. I think this was a similar kind of strategy meeting where they plan for the future. And I don't mm. think those plans inclu include war with the United States. In fact, I would argue, I think those plans include how to avoid war with the United States, despite what they know will be escalating provocations so they can get through this, continue to build their alliances. Mm. You see the long ther term things they're doing economically. So I you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm being, you know, Pollyanna-ish here, but I do have some level of confidence that <laughs> mm. they they understand this as well as we do, and they're planning how to get around it. I think you're absolutely right. Actually, I don't think you're being Pollyannish at all. I I read Russian Chinese statements all the time. I get the sense that they have a very clear understanding of the kind of people they're up against in Washington. They know both how dangerous they are. They know exactly what they're trying to do and trying to bait them into confrontations. And they're not going to be drawn into those confrontations. And can I just, before we proceed, touch on Putin's comments in that speech he made yesterday about nuclear weapons, because they have been completely misrepresented. It was, I, I've, I've read people say, I read Reuters say, that he was threatening to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. He said no such thing. He said if the Western powers were to launch nuclear weapons against us because they sensed that you know things were not going the way they intended, well, be aware, we have them too, and we will respond. But he wasn't talking about using nuclear weapons proactively. And I think this is a point which, as I said, has been completely misrepresented. It continues to be. All the talk about West nuclear weapons use up to now has been entirely in the West, not in Russia at all up to this point. But I don't think the Russians want to go there. I don't think they have any intention of going there. I think this is a warning to the West. Don't go there. If you do, you will get yourself into serious trouble. Now, Let's just turn to the situation with the war. I think you're absolutely right. I think you're, by the way, your analysis is about, you know, this mobilization is completely right. I've been, again, following Russian commentaries, not just on their telegram channels, but on their television, on their newspapers. There's been this rumbling growth. Why are we not, you know, going, why are we not taking this seriously? Why are we wasting time, you know, with, military exercises in the Far East? Why aren't we mobilizing? Why aren't we sending more of our army there? Why aren't we settling this? Now it's happened. We're going to see far bigger forces being deployed by Russia in this conflict in Ukraine. We're going to see actual moves to incorporate these regions into Russia itself, changing the legal basis of the war. Now, I don't see how you, Ukraine, even with all the Western support it's had, can absorb this latest attack, which is coming. Now, is that something people in Washington understand? Um, well, I mean, do they still think that they can pull something off? I mean, I don't understand what they're thinking now. Yeah, I, I think there's two things going on here. There's the, you know, there's the information yeah. war, which let me add this, the in, but when people talk about the information war, you have to talk about who is it directed towards. It's directed towards the people of the West. The information war is to um, mislead and misinform the people of the of, of the West. So there, there's the part of it that is just simply the information war. But I think that there are people in the Pentagon who clearly understand the reality um, of the potential war that they're, um, 
you know, that they're they're on the edge of. I also think they understand that um, they don't have the physical forces, you know, having talked to Scott Ritter a number of times, they don't have the physical forces really for a confrontation in the uh, in the uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, a, a, a kinetic confrontation, uh, a confrontation with Russia. So they understand how that's going going to go. I think they understand a lot more than they let on because they play the narrative game and you know the narrative game you're always trying to figure out how much they really mean and and how much is you know pure unadulterated lies and with the neocons uh 100 pure un, uh, unadulterated lies uh most of the time but i think they understand more than they think um but uh i think the important to me the here, here's something important because I, I keep getting into time they have a huge problem with all of their plans. I've, I understand. Have you said that? Uh, have you heard that it's going to take two to three months for this mobilization? Is the, are those the numbers you're hearing? Which is perfect for Russia. Mm -hmm. If they maintain the pressure in two to three months, we're in November again. You know, it's kind of like if you you're playing a football game, what what other kind of football game and you have a small lead and, and, and it's getting close to close to close to the end. You're. Um, ad, you know, if you're behind, your adversary is not the other team. Your adversary is the clock, right? You've got to score quickly because the clock's going. You, the, the clock's running, and you got to try all kinds of things again. That, that, that which which argues your point mm. that they could try some things provocation. But I think that now, when we get into November, Europe is going to be in deep and serious trouble. And the future is not going to be. The, excuse me, the present is not going to be looking mm. bright, and it'll be much more difficult. You know, the the closer we get into winter, the more difficult it gets for the neocons and for the people in their their vassals in Europe to stage provocations to drag their people along. The people are going to be screaming louder and louder. Look, you've got to look internally and fix these problems, and they're not going to be able to do it. And let me add this: the Russians are um, doing. You know, on the battlefield, they're making a move. It wouldn't surprise me if at some point accompanying the new move on the battlefield, you know, as a response to one of these provocations, as a response to, you know, some move by the um, by the neocons that they don't say that's it. We're cutting your uh, fertilizer. We're cutting your gas. We are cutting everything until further notice. And they do it when um, the West could least possibly absorb that. And so they mm. set themselves. I mean, if I'm running Russia, I say, as I get closer to launching my big offensive, I'm going to put you in great jeopardy and peril at home. I'm going to make the move just before I do that, because I know you're planning on something, but I'm going to throw a, you know, a burr under mm. your saddle. Just as you plan it, I'm going to hit you with another one and your people are going to start screaming at you and you're going to have that. See, the leaders in the West have two enemies. One enemy by, that they of choice is Russia, China. The other enemy that they're going to have is uprisings at home. And I'm going to, if I'm Russia, I'm going to fuel those uprisings as I make a move by mm. cutting you off. Not to mention, you know, I'm just kind of angry and mean. So I'm, I'm not giving you any of that stuff if you're trying to screw me over. So it's a good thing I'm not the leader because, you know, things would already be bad. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. So, can I turn to another topic which is very closely related to these? Because obviously we're going to see, we are going to see more and more economic distress in Europe, certainly, probably in the United States. We're going to see more protests. We're going to see more people coming out and saying there has to be a change of course. But I can't help but think that simultaneously and at the same time, we're going to see the powers that be, especially in Europe, say, responding to all of this. They're going to say, look, you're a Putin agent. You're a, if you're coming out and you're protesting against this, you're, you're somebody who's basically um, on the side of the enemy. And therefore, we've got to start taking more and more steps against you. We're going to pursue your disinformation. Uh, we're going to try and shut you down as a disinformer. We're going to investigate you. We're going to do all sorts of things of that kind. And I have to say, um, we're starting to see, we're not we're starting to see, we are seeing a lot of that happen in the United States as well. Is that going to get worse? 
Yeah, oh, uh, uh, you know, absolutely. I agree that it will get far worse out of desperation. Again, the what we're seeing, what we're going to see with the leaders, and this happens with the collapse of empires, is their biggest fear becomes uprising at home. Their biggest fear becomes revolution at home um, it, because they have to manage the people because the bottom line is this. The people, let me just say, of the EU and the people of the U.S. have an illusion that they are in a democracy. They have an illusion that they are independent and sovereign. And the more desperate the US gets, the more it casts the illusion aside. It says we can't you know, afford the illusion anymore. So we're just gonna come right out and say to the leaders of Europe, destroy your economies, and you know we don't who cares if the people start to figure out that they're being had that you know you're just a colony now so i think that um um we're going to see um certainly increased um uh, uh, you know, uh, censorship and, 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 and the government going after diss dissident opinions and things of that nature. But again, as we get, as, as General Winter gallops with his icy white steed into Europe um, and people start facing existential threats, namely food and, you know, clothing and, and, and warmth and things of that nature, the, the the problem they're going to have, if I say to you, you're a Russian bot and you should be dealt with, okay, you know, people may be afraid they'll lose their job, whatever. But as people start to be concerned for the lives and existence of their families, they're no longer rational. Those are arguments that, you know, evoke some kind of a rational response, some kind of an, an anger, some kind of a denial. And I think they're pushing people to the point where they will no longer be rational and they won't care. Look, if I'm starving to death, what do I care if you call me a dissident or a Russian bot? I got bigger fish to fry. My family and I have no food mm. and we're about to be thrown out. Mm. So the problem that they have is they're pushing people into a corner so far that they're not going to want to talk anymore. You know, they're going to get to a point where people are like surrounding the Capitol building. You know, we've uh, seen this happen in history where people surround the Capitol building. And here's a, one of the great dangers. And as you know, one of the great dangers of any um, anyone who is in power is, you know, the people all come out. There's one hundred and fifty thousand. There's a million, however many people. And they come to the Capitol building. They come to the building of power, Congress, whatever it is. And there's the proverbial Praetorian guard, you know, there's the police or whoever, and they've got their guns pointed at the um, at the crowd. And the crowd says, we want X. And the people say, we ain't going to get it. And the crowd says, we're coming in the buildings. And here's the danger. The leaders say to the police, the soldiers, whatever, mm. fire, take them out, stop them. Mm. At that point, if the police, if the guards of the state drops their guns and says, we ain't mm. shooting our own people, or mm. says, wait a minute, we're on their side. These are our families. It's over for the government. So that's the the government, if they push the people to a point, which seems to be coming, mm. where the mm. people, you know, seek redress physically and come to their buildings and say, look, something's mm. got to give. And they, at that point, they attempt to put that down through state violence or whatever. What happens? when mm. the police or whoever who are also mm. remember the police and i was a policeman yeah. for years the policemen can't pay their bills they can't feed their families mm. they it's they can't heat their homes etc if you push it to the point where they drop their guns and they say we're on their side it's over you've lost everything so that's the danger that the lead, leaders put themselves in when they if they make an attempt to do you know kind of the ultimate put down of state violence the closer they get to that the closer they get to um, the guards, the people that they count on protecting them, siding with the, um, you know, the hoi polloi, <laughs> the, <laughs> the great unwashed, the crowds of us out here who don't matter to the to the, um, the ruling elite. Indeed, and they were already nervous about the loyalty of the National Guard that they deployed in Washington at the start of 2021, which I found astonishing. By the way, on that, just at a quick historical point, I've been to the place that the square in St. Petersburg, where exactly what you said happened in 1917, the place where the Cossacks actually switched sides, which set in train the whole sequence of events which led to the Tsar's abdication a few days later. So, you know, I, 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 I've, I've actually been at the very physical spot where that happened. So, um, and a number of a number of other things. Do you think the neocons, when they started this whole thing, expected to be in this position? Did they imagine the economic crisis 
that is now unfolding. Did they believe that if they started to impose these sanctions, that um, it would backfire on them in the way that it has? Because I tell you, I mean, it's a loaded question because I, I know the I, I'm sure I know the answer, which is that they didn't, that they didn't in their wildest dreams imagine that it would come to this. But but what are your what are your thoughts about this? I mean, did, were they prepared for this in any way? Um, absolutely not. I would recommend people, if you want to understand the neocons and these technocrats, there's a great book. I love to read. I read all the time because lots of books behind me. And um, the, a great book by John Ralston Saul called Voltaire's Bastards. And it describes the neocons, the technocrats and how they got there. And there's a saying in psychiatry, um, neurotics build houses in the sky, psychotics live in them. Right. And they do both. They do both. So they create this narrative. They all get together. They get this group think and they say this is going to happen. We know that's going to happen within a few weeks. Russia's going to fall apart. Why? For God's sake, it's just a gas station with uh, masquerading as a country, et cetera, et cetera. And everything falls apart. And they then simply regroup and say, well, then it's, then we'll do this. Because the interesting thing about watching the rule of the neocons is watching governments that have no concern whatsoever for their constituents. They almost seem to show contempt for the working class, contempt for the average person out here that's making a, 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 a living. You know, they have no, if you look at the way, to me, look at the way these people are treating the Ukrainian soldiers and the Ukrainian people. They're casting their lives aside with total and remarkable disregard. They're throwing the Ukrainian bodies at Russian artillery as though they were, you know, as though they were playing a game. The, it, so I see them. Um, and I don't know if this is even metaphorically, it may be realistically, as sociopaths. The thing to remember, think about socio, again, a great book, The Sociopath Next Door to Understand Sociopaths. But the sociopath, they go out in the street and they could care less about anybody. They don't care if they run you over. They don't care if they steal your stuff. They could care less because they really have no remorse and no conscience. But when a sociopath comes home, they treat their family the same way because they don't have particular emotional tools. They don't have a conscience. They don't have a fear of consequences, things of that nature. So the way a sociopath treats his enemies is exactly the same way that a sociopath treats their friends, allies, family, et cetera, because they don't have the emotional tools to view anybody as anything other than mm -hmm. something to feed their sociopathic tendencies. That's what we see about the neocons. And there are some inherent weaknesses that are created by that, a number of them, but that's where they are right now. They don't really care about the American people. They don't care about anything like that. Mm -hmm. I do think it will be interesting to see what happens, the backlash after November. I, su I suspect that the Democrats will get wiped out here and how that will affect things, I don't know, because I don't know how much you know about the Republican Party, but the leadership in, a, in, in the, the largest portion of the Republican Party is captured by the same forces that um, hold the Democrats. But it will be interesting to see if that in any way, shape or form um, has an effect. The one thing it will have, one place area it will definitely have an effect. And that is if, in, in fact, the, the Republicans have um, gained power, they will start um, going after Biden and his team. And that will put them on their back feet a little bit. They'll have to, because now they're going to have, oh, the evil Russians, we got to deal with them. Oh, the American people are unhappy because we're in a recession. We got to deal with them. Oh, no, here the Republicans are coming after us for Hunter Biden or, you know, Russiagate or Fauci or whatever the case may be. So it will be it, basically another front will be opened against the Biden administration and the neocons, even though it'll be other by, by other neocons. And I'll add this. And. I don't look for the Republicans to do some kind of a great, you know, unveiling of information for the benefit of all. I look for them to do investigations, unfortunately, in, in a lot of ways, um, on behalf of the national security state. I don't think they're going to investigate Hunter Biden and Joe Biden that much for Ukraine. They're going to investigate them for China so that they can then say, there we go, Biden's been doing something with China, 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 China's bad. Well, what about the other things? What about Ukraine? Eh, bio, eh, let's get back to China. So that's what I expect. I have no confidence that the mm. Republicans are gonna do anything outside of the national security state switches. Mm. Mm. Uh, by the way, I, I agree with that. And what is fascinating, Garland, is of course you've, you've we, because we have people, we've, we've interviewed many people on the Republican side, Robert Barnes, you're, you're on the progressive side, but on this, 
on this analysis, you you converge, I think. You both say that, you know, uh, there'll probably be a Republican sweep in in Congress, but it will it will that 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 doesn't mean that the establishment, the leadership of the Republican Party is going to be in any way interested in changing anything fundamental. They will be trying to use it for their own purposes. And I think this is a this is exactly right. But it does suggest that there is going to be a cracking in US politics. What, do you think this is true? Do you think this yeah. is likely? Yes. And, and you know, something that you brought up, and that is the whole business, there's this discussion of, you know, the left, the right, the center, et cetera. And a, a few comments on that. Number one, um, mm. you know, the term fascism is thrown, always thrown about, right? And uh, uh, traditionally, we've heard like ultranationalism is fascism, right? Mm. I believe um, that to an extent, a large extent, what we see with the Biden people is an ultra liberalism, that it's another flavor of fascism. You know, you can get in the same way that you use the word democracies, but there are various types of democracies, a democracy in a particular country as a result of the particular culture of that country and the history of that country produces its own variants of, de of democracy. And I think it's the same way with fascism. You know, look at the different types of fascism worldwide. And I think the Biden administration is a, um, a form, a flavor of 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 uh of fascism. So um I look at um 